McCorm being present, the Subcommittee on Early Childhood, Elementary, and Secondary Education will come to order. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing on career and technical education. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us as we explore opportunities to better serve America's workforce. Young adults are entering a job market today that is vastly different than the one that existed just a generation ago. Technological advances and the growth of a global economy have significantly changed the kinds of jobs available and the skills required to do them, making quality education and training vital ingredients to success in today's workplaces. This new reality has been painfully evident in the wake of the recent recession. We are more than six years into the so-called recovery, yet millions of Americans continue to struggle with finding a good paying job. Meanwhile, industries critical to our economy, healthcare, engineering, and manufacturing, for example, have jobs to fill and not enough qualified applicants to take them, a problem we have come to know as the skills gap. Recognizing the urgent need to close the gap and put Americans back to work, Republicans and Democrats came together last Congress to fix a broken and outdated job training system. The bipartisan, bicameral effort resulted in what we call the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, a common sense solution to modernize and improve the federal workforce development system. The Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act will help workers attain skills for 21st century jobs and cultivate a modern workforce that evolving American businesses truly need. But we still have more work to do. By reauthorizing the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, we have an opportunity to help even more Americans, especially younger Americans, to enter the workforce with the tools and knowledge necessary to compete in the high-skilled, uh, in-demand jobs of our economy. In short, to compete in a 21st century world and win. Last reauthorized in 2006, the law provides federal support for state and local programs focused on preparing high school and community college students for technical careers. Now, unfortunately, many of these career and technical education programs have not kept pace with the changing workforce. In a report released by the Council for Chief State School Officers, education leaders explained that, quote, career education in too many of our secondary schools reflects an outdated model that tolerates low expectations as often misaligned with the evolving needs of the current labor market. With more than 14% of young adults unemployed and the highest level of unfilled jobs since 2001, it's no wonder states have started to take action. My home state of Indiana, for example, is partner partnering with local businesses to develop a new high school curriculum that better meets the needs of local communities and ensures that students are prepared to enter high-skilled jobs right after earning their diploma. As Governor Mike Pence testified at a, at a hearing here earlier this year, quote, for those students who are not bound for the traditional four-year college, we must still ensure that they can thrive in future careers. And one way to do this is to, again, make career and technical education a priority, unquote. By working with the private sector to develop resources for successful career and technical education programs, Indiana has made incredible gains over the last two years. The state has helped thousands of hardworking Hoosiers join the workforce and attracted more good paying jobs for people in our communities. It's our hope that the success we've experienced in Indiana not only continues for our state, but go, uh, is replicated across the country. The goal at the federal level, and what we are here to discuss today, is how to ensure our investment in these state and local efforts is paying off for students that we all aim to serve. To help reach that goal, we should consider reforms that encourage states to align high school and post-secondary coursework with the needs of the workforce. This will require a look at existing federal requirements, many of which, uh, in my opinion, are duplicative and can, be, and can hinder state and local efforts to development and implement their own successful programs. Helping Americans compete in, and succeed in today's workforce remains one of the committee's leading priorities, and today's discussion is an important part of that effort. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses as we work to improve the Perkins Act and strengthen support for young Americans as they enter the workforce. And before I recognize my friend and ranking member Fudge, I would like to note that one of our witness, witnesses today, Dr. Douglas Major, is a resident of Stillwater, Oklahoma. On Saturday, the people of Stillwater and the surrounding communities were celebrating Oklahoma, State's University, Oklahoma State University's homecoming when a driver crashed into the homecoming parade. 
This terrible tragedy injured more than 40 individuals and killed four others. Dr. Major, on behalf of this committee, I want to extend my deepest sympathies to you, people of Stillwater, and the entire Oklahoma State University community. We pray for the recovery of those who remain hospitalized and in critical condition, and we lift up our thoughts and prayers to the victims and their families. And thank you for uh, being able to continue to be with us today. I would now would like to recognize Ranking Member Fudge for her opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. Um, today we're going to examine the critical role of career and technical education programs that prepare our nation's students for success in college and career. Many of these programs are funded through the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Improvement Act of 2006. According to Judge Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, in the next five years, 65% of all jobs in the United States will require training beyond high school. In my home state of Ohio, career and technical education is available at every public high school. Other states should follow Ohio's lead, so career and technical education is available at every high school across this nation. The importance of CTE cannot be overstated. Its programs equip our nation's students with the skills they need to succeed in a rapidly evolving 21st century economy. Unfortunately, after harmful sequestration cuts, public funding for CTE is at historic lows. It is clear that we should not continue to cut funding for critical programs like CTE that engage students with an integrated curriculum of core academic content and real-world work-based relevance. Instead, we must support high-quality CTE programs. Currently, our nation faces an unprecedented skills gap, and CTE programs are integral to closing that gap. We must do everything we can to maintain and strengthen these programs. For many years, the Perkins Act has supported the development of CTE programs that cultivate in-demand skills among secondary and post-secondary students. We must do more to spur innovation with the delivery of CTE to reward and replicate programs achieving positive outcomes for students in industry and to ensure CTE is positioned to drive economic success through better workforce alignment and increased collaboration. Reauthorization of the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act presents this committee with an opportunity to ensure that all students are equipped with the skills to succeed in a rapidly evolving 21st century economy. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished panel of witnesses and working with the majority to reauthorize the act. Uh, further, uh, I have received, Mr. Chairman, a letter from uh, our colleague, Mr. Langevin, and uh, he would like to enter it into the record. Without objection. Thank you very much. And, and Dr. Major, my condolences as well. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Fudge. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, all members will be permitted to submit written statements to be included in the permanent hearing record. And without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days to allow such statements and other extraneous material referenced during the hearing to be submitted for the official hearing record. I will now turn to the introduction of our distinguished witnesses. Dr. Ireland Ricks is Director of Diversity and Life Science Programs with Keystone Symposia on Molecular and Cellular Biology. Dr. Ricks oversees the Keystone Symposia Fellows Program, the Underrepresented Scholarship and Early Career Investigator Travel Award Programs, and additional mentoring programs that take place in connection with Keystone Symposia's Life Science Research Conferences. She has served as a grants administrator at Howard University and a policy analyst for the White House Office of Management and Budget. Welcome. I will now ask our witnesses to stand and raise your right hand. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witness has answered all in the affirmative, and you may be seated. And before I recognize uh, you to provide your testimony, let me briefly explain our lighting system. You each have five minutes to present your testimony, and uh, just like the traffic lights, when, when one, minute is, one, one minute is left, the light will turn yellow. Well, I'm not sure a traffic light stays yellow for a minute, but you get the point. Um, I can say something about my spouse and traffic. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> when your time has expired, the light will turn red. At that point, I'll ask you to wrap up your remarks as best you're able. Members will each have five minutes to ask questions of you then. For Dr. Ricks, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Rakita, Ranking Member Fudge, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony to the Committee on Education and the Workforce and to share my perspective on improving career and technical education to help students succeed in the workforce. Specifically, I will discuss the role of the importance of technical education in the development of career pathways in non-traditional fields for underrepresented groups. For more than 25 years, I have served as an educator, advocate, and social science researcher. I currently serve as the Director of Diversity Life Sciences for Keystone Symposia on Molecular and Cellular Biology in Silverthorne, Colorado. My responsibility is to manage programs that serve underrepresented, or what we call UR students, postdoctoral fellows and early career scientists, including our flagship fellows program for UR assistant professors and research scientists. Many of the UR researchers who participate in our meetings and professional development programs come from public and private universities and states represented by members of this committee, including but not limited to institutions such as Emory, Stanford, the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Virginia, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Michigan State University. I am also a member of the board of directors of the Augustus F. Hawkins Foundation, a public education and workforce foundation founded by and subsequently named after the former chairman of this distinguished committee. In the past, career and technical education, or CTE, was associated with vocational education as a training platform for low-income and immigrant populations who had little access to more highly paid jobs that require formal post-secondary education. And in the past, CTE teachers were fairly low salary workers. But according to 2012 Bureau of Labor Statistics, the median salary for CTE teachers was $51,910, placing those teachers squarely into the American middle class. A 2014 U.S. Census report cited statistics that non-Hispanic Asians were most likely to hold a bachelor's degree or higher, followed by non-Hispanic whites, while 31% of Asians hold a bachelor's degree at their highest level of attainment, and 18% hold an advanced degree. 20% of non-Hispanic whites hold a bachelor's degree and 12% an advanced degree. However, blacks and Hispanics of any race were most concentrated at lower levels of educational attainment. Only 39% of blacks and Hispanics reported high school completion as their highest level of traditional educational attainment. And 13% of blacks and 28% of Hispanics or Latinos did not complete high school at all. When you total this, nearly 41% of minorities, African Americans and Latinos, don't complete high school. These are shocking numbers for any nation, but for the most industrialized nation in the world, an inability to ensure secondary educational completion signals a critical failure in the system. If students are unable to master basic skill sets, that's reading, writing, computation, and critical thinking, it is far more difficult for them to secure and sustain gainful employment. However, one of the advantages of CTE is its emphasis on technical training and soft skills development, such as interviewing techniques, job persistence, and interpersonal communication. Short-term education is a possible way to lift groups, including Latinos and African Americans, with low levels of educational attainment into better economic standing. Recent economic challenges have pushed many Americans towards short-term education options, and this short-term education may pay off. CTE programs and the credentials that they offer provide access to higher wages, higher demand jobs, particularly in emerging industry sectors. Almost 30% of people with less than associate's degree, including licenses and certificates, earn more than many of the average bachelor degree recipients. It is a fact that many Americans do not attend college. However, as a birthright, every American expects to have a job that allows them to feed their families, have access to affordable health care, and live with dignity. Fortunately, although CTE was once stigmatized and relegated to the dungeons of education, it is now considered as a viable opportunity for both non-traditional and college-bound students. 
In fact, just this year, the United States Presidential Scholars Program established a new category of outstanding scholars in CTE. The Resurgence of Apprenticeships programs is a welcome addition to the CTE portfolio, and I am pleased that legislation such as the Apprenticeship and Jobs Training Act of 2015 are gaining currency. I thank the members of the committee for the opportunity to share a realistic perspective of how CTE can serve as a transformative toolkit for the education and workforce development of U.S. current and future labor markets. I look forward to your question. Let me uh, start the subcommittee's um, questioning. Dr. Dr. Ricks, um, career training uh, used to be known as vocational education, which traditionally was a dumping ground for people that weren't going to make it academically. Can you say a word about how important it is that the uh, career training include the basics so if a person wants to get in career training and decides, well, maybe I want to go to a four-year liberal arts college after all, that they're not left behind. It's actually quite critical that um, the basic skills are um, adopted in the CTE programs um, because one of the things that employers are finding, and it doesn't matter what industry, including the biomedical sciences, is that students are coming into the workforce um, very poorly prepared to write, um, to um, think critically, to um, be creative in um, the ways they approach a problem. So CTE um, curricula typically offer those kinds of opportunities for their participants. So they build in on-the-job training. So they give them scenarios. They give them, um, they set up case studies for them to um, learn how to learn on the job. And I think that that is critical. I think it's critical for everyone. Even in the industry that um, I've been working in for the last 20 years with biomedical science researchers, those skills are still very important for them, whether they're going to NIH, whether they're going to the National Science Foundation for research grants or to conduct research. Those are critical skills. And CTE provides those skill sets. And I think we have typically um, sort of divided students based on who's going to college, who's not going to college, um, what kinds of skill sets are needed, and that's um, really an artificial construction because everyone needs the same skill sets. Everyone needs to know how to think, how to read, and how to write well. And so if someone gets in a career track, it's, it's never too late to switch back to an academic track and go to college. Over the past well, long before I came to Congress, I worked on workforce development issues, and it, w it amazed me that um, that that was that time period of, of middle school was where we really need to zero in on, um, um, as kids are exposed to so much more today. Uh, Dr. Rex, you uh, um, you had noted uh, that uh, you know, fortunately, I'm going to quote you from your testimony. Fortunately, although career and technical education was once stigmatized and relegated to the dungeon of education, it is now considered a, as a viable opportunity for both traditional and college-bound students. And I certainly agree with you on that. I'm excited about that. But I don't think we've gotten everybody yet. So I, within your research, have you really looked at Because I feel that there's still a stigma out there among parents. Yeah. And parents are the, the leading... I mean, they're steering the decision making. They're exposing the kids to opportunities. Uh, has your research found anything there and anything that would be helpful for uh, turning that stigma around? Well, one of the things that I've discovered is that guidance counselors need to be approached. And I think that um, we need to look at it um, in a um, collaborative way with parents and guidance counselors working together to talk about CTE and the benefits of CTE and looking at the professional association of guidance counselors. I attended a meeting, um, I think it was last year, and um, here in Washington, and they were talking about the role of guidance counselors in steering students away from CTE and how they need to be brought into the fold. Because surprisingly, many guidance counselors aren't that aware of CTE. They still call it vocational education. They still see it as a two-tiered system. And so they tell their college-bound students not to go um, into CTE coursework. So I think that there can be more effort made to um, in the school, not with, just with the guidance counselors. Absolutely. No, we have language within the Student Success Act that hopefully we'll be going to conference soon with ESEA that. Uh, that really looks at parental engagement centers. Are, 
Uh, Ranking Member Fudge, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you for your testimony. Dr. Ricks, you stated that 41% of minorities do not complete high school, which in my opinion highlights the disproportionately negative effect education policies have had on black and Hispanic students. Uh, the racial divide is compounded when funding streams for hands-on short-term education and career training are cut. We do know that uh, funding for Perkins has declined by 24% since 1998, and in particular because of sequestration over the last few years. Can you tell me how these, these cuts have affected uh, underrepresented students in CTE programs? The underrepresented students, um, because of some of these challenges um, with the budgets and with the um, lack of parental involvement and guidance from the guidance counselors has resulted in fewer students participating, um, fewer students of color participating in CTE, and, and that's a problem. And I think that we need to rebrand CTE. We have tried to change the name CTE rather than vocate, you know, vocad. So I think that we need to um, consider creative ways. And, and I go back to um, what I said earlier about the role of CTE in stimulating creativity and critical thinking in our students. We need to do the same here in Washington and in all the other policy institutes that um, look at education in a very serious way. And I think um, what has happened with underrepresented students is that they become even more discouraged. And one of the things that we study as researchers, social science researchers in education is looking at the, the emphasis on role modeling. The, the less likely you are to see yourself in a particular role, the less likely you are to participate in that role. And so that's what's happened. Thank you very much. Ms. Bonamici, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. This is such an important conversation. As we know that the CTE courses can help prepare students to succeed in careers, but also on college campuses, as we've discussed, and help them be prepared. But that isn't all. The students also learn the soft skills as well as the hard skills. And I know Dr. Ricks mentioned this, like teamwork and the ability to communicate and that serves them throughout their lives, regardless of where they end up in a career. The good quality CTE classes accomplishes while also preparing students uh, to do well academically in post-secondary education, as well as the workforce. And, and I really wanna emphasize, because we've been talking a lot about how we message this and what's happened in our conversations, the E part of CTE stands for education. So we're not, we're not trying to convert education into job training. This is about educating students to be prepared for wh whichever path that they take. And I, I wanna mention, we're, we're talking about success stories. I have uh, several from the district I represent, Sherwood High School and Sherwood, Oregon. They have an all-girls welding class. It fills up every year. Uh, they also have a program where the students build a house. They take architecture classes, interior design, environmental science, and construction, and then they, they build and sell the house. It's a great experience. And, and they have a mobile fab lab where the teacher has an RV and he drives around not just to other schools but to other districts to help uh, inform their teachers uh, about what they can do. But, but the tremendous benefit, and I've seen and talked with the students who participate in these classes, that, that they, they get inherent benefit from making something tangible and those lessons are really important. Newburgh High School in my district has a whole range from culinary classes to CAD labs, and when I was out there, they said, that, em, really emphasize the importance of the Perkins funding. Yamhill Carlton High School, which is down in wine country, not only do they have a manufacturing class with a local um, a polymer manufacturer, they've also started a viticulture class at their, at their high school, and then there are courses that continue at the community college. Uh, Portland Community College has one of the nation's top job training programs, is recognized by the White House where they use an innovative approach to help uh, unemployed workers complete uh, short-term stackable credits that give them skills. So those are just a, a few of the, the examples. And, and Dr. Ricks, I mentioned the all-girls uh, welding class at Sherwood High School and their home building 
uh, class. Now that, that district has about 5,000 students. Mm. This, um, this beautiful pen you might have noticed because we're in a small room today, that the wood pen was made by a student <coughs> at Gaston. Um, they have 564 students total in their entire school district. When their teacher and gave me this pen, he talked about what this means to the students to actually make things and how engaged they are. Warrenton High School over on the Oregon coast has only 285 students, but they run a fish hatchery at their school and have an aquaculture program. So Dr. Ricks, how do you bring high quality academic programs, especially to rural and underrepresented communities? And, and I share your concern about, and Dr. Major and all of you on the panel about a shift, what a shift to competitive funding would mean, but how do you really bring those programs around the country to rural and underrepresented um, students as well as in large urban districts? Um, well, it's not easy. Um, one of the things that um, I've done in the past, I've worked in different organizations that have tried to especially reach out to rural and underrepresented um, communities. When I was at NOAA, I was on a contract with the um, Office of Education, and they have a mandate to try to do that. And so they, when you talked about the aquaculture and fisheries, I thought about NOAA and how they've been doing that for some time with um, K through 12 students. And there's a number of activities that um, the different federal agencies have been engaged in um, looking at how to build interest, especially because I come from you know, the STEM right. um, background, looking at um, how science, technology, engineering, and math can be integrated to um, grow um, interest oh, in. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I want to get yeah. another quick question in. Oh. One thing that people always are concerned about, or at least I feel uh, contributes to the high cost of education today is the number of non-teaching personnel hired by all, uh, all institutions of higher learning. Um, one of the things I wondered about, I noticed, uh, well, um, Ms. Ricks, or uh, Dr. Ricks, um, a couple comments on your testimony. First of all, you say we can no longer afford to educate only an elite class of citizens. That's kind of a damning statement about America, and I don't think that's been true throughout my lifetime. Do you really believe in America we've, or when was the last time you really feel we only educated an elite class of citizens in this country? Well, when you look at the numbers of the students who actually graduate from college, um, it's typically, um, and the Department of Education, NSF reports, is typically students who can afford to go. And because income has been a barrier, it has become, and it hasn't always been, um, but it has definitely become a system that um, discourages students who cannot afford to go. They cannot afford to persist beyond their first year of undergraduate education. And I'm talking about students who did not come in with merit-based or need-based scholarships, just students who are just, you know, your average student trying to get into college and graduate. So, so you, those numbers are... Uh, let me get you out. You're saying something I didn't expect. In other words, you're saying right now it's harder to get through college if you're kind of middle class as opposed to the people who qualify for the Pell Grants. Is that what you're telling us? N not in... Well, it, there's, there's two different issues. Um, you have the students who come in need-based, and then you have the students who don't anticipate the need that they will require to graduate. And so uh, there's, there's a slight difference there. So you can have students that have received financial aid that still, um, there is a gap. There's a huge gap between what they receive and what they need in order to fully participate in the college experience. And I'm not even talking extracurricular. I'm talking Gentlemen's about when you- time's expired. Sorry. I think the gentleman- I talked too much, sorry. Um, gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you all for what you do. I just met with all my career and technical folks a couple weeks back. I've been working in this Virginia State Senate with some of the leaders there for seven or eight years. I was a college professor for 20 years, went to seminary before that. I don't know what went wrong. So I've been in education my whole life. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just, I give the Congresswoman Bonamici says, I know what you're going to ask every time because I ask the same question every time, one way or the other. But my challenge to you be, you're all doing the Lord's work, et cetera. Uh, but there's a problem in K to 12. 
And so, and people have been asking the parents, and there's all this inside baseball up here, all these terms, and, you know, like we're going to fix this through policy. And so we're spending $13,000 a year per kid for 13 years, and they don't know what business is when they get out. It's unbelievable. So you guys are saying, let's find some skills for them. Well, I don't blame you, right? So if you're coming out and you don't know what a business is, and you don't know about free markets and economics or any of that, then you're doing the next best step. Let's get these kids some skills and fit them into uh, empty sectors where there's some jobs, right? So I get that. But I'm, I'll just go through all for you real quick. Just how can we start to teach kids about free markets and get them excited about business? They're going to spend every waking hour of their life in business. And yet, sometimes we, get, we tell them business is bad, right? So the rest of your life, all your waking hours is going to be spent doing something morally bad. I mean, it, right? It's no one. The kids look at you and go, I don't get it. I, my governor in uh, Virginia is on the other side of the aisle. He's going around the world doing great stuff. Right? He's getting jobs from China and India and down, all this kind of stuff. And yet we don't work together to convey that energy to the kids. This is the way it works up here in the big leagues. right? All the business people know what you got to do to make money and be successful. But we don't give those secrets to the kids. And so, and I'll just put on my econ hat. I did economics for years. The industrial revolution skills, not they've been with us forever. They didn't cause modern economic growth. And it just, I want to be clear on that. And uh, you can go look at a bipartisan uh, author favorite of mine, Deidre McCloskey. She's got a six-volume set out. She's Nobel caliber economist. And I'd recommend that to all of you on, on why markets matter more than all these other subsets, right? education, skills, all, they, we have to do all the above. But if you don't have working markets for kids to plug those skills in, if you go to a top-down communist society and you got skills, it, you're not going to get growth. You know, kids won't end up rich. And so I just want, what can we do to pump up and motivate the K-12 system so that the kids are more prepared for the skills when they get to you, and I'm not leaving you enough, but if you can just all weigh in as you see fit. I will just share that one of the things that we built into the Utah Aerospace Pathways Partnership was that our professional development in the secondary schools, the teachers had to be part of that training. They had to go to Boeing. They had to go to Hexel. They had to be part of that so that they could be um, on the floor, in the environment, understanding that particular industry much more clearly than if they would just been in kind of the shelter of their own uh, secondary school. Yeah, I was going to say some of the um, larger corporations have been doing that for some time, like IBM. Their employees give back and they get um, community service credit for going into the local schools and talking about business, talking about their industries. Dr. Ricks, uh, you have had tremendous experience on bringing women and people of color into the STEM field. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience in Washington, D.C., and what lessons you think uh, that we can incorporate for the Perkins program? Um, one of the things that I think um, that underpins the barriers for women and um, underrepresented groups is this, um, and what they're now calling unconscious bias or stereotype threat, where they feel that they can't do the work, that they can't compete. And so I think if we give enough opportunities and we provide enough role modeling, I think that that goes very, very far. And organizations like the American um, Women in Science, AWIS, and other groups like that have gone very far in making sure that women and girls in particular are given these kinds of opportunities to see themselves in the roles that they envision. Um, and so that's, I think we, we tend to kind of um, minimize the importance of that, but it, it matters. Like when you look around this room, they've done studies on how even the Congress, they'll say you know, to young girls and people of color, do you see yourself becoming a congressperson one day? And more frequently now, the answer is yes, because they see themselves. And so that is critical in the sciences in particular. They still do, um, and I think it's kind of funny, but they still do these kinds of um, studies where they'll ask young children who are the scientists, and typically they will choose a white male in a lab coat. Um, that's changing now. So now you see scientists of different colors, different backgrounds, different um, um, ages, because it was always someone over 50, now it's someone under 50. Um, so I think that we General can just do a lot expired. In, in, in doing that. Thank the witnesses again for their testimony. And Ms. Fudge, you're recognized for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, I have for many years talked about the fact that America once again needs to build and make things. 
Uh, we have always been the, the nation that everyone looked to for quality. And so we need people who are skilled to do this work. Once we get back to being who we are as a nation, certainly young people will have jobs and they will see the alternatives that you are trying to present. So I just hope that you are successful and I certainly hope that this Congress moves forward to reauthorize uh, this act and to once again understand who we are as a nation, uh, that we are the best and that we need to continue to be the best by making sure we have a workforce that is able to keep us at, on the top. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentle lady and I echo the gentle lady's comments in closing. I want to thank our witnesses again and I uh, appreciate, I really do, your leadership and what you're doing for America's future, our best asset, our children and our students. And with that, seeing no further business before the committee, this hearing is adjourned.